Hi. So now I wanted to discuss something that we've already seen before in, in, in when we started talking about the Navier-Stokes equation. And we, we used this very diagram to uh, f flow of a viscous fluid through uh, a pipe and, and we remarked that uh, velocity, because it's a viscous fluid, the velocity would go to zero right at the surfaces of the pipe, but the velocity would have its maximum value at the very, very center. And so we guessed that the, you know, the profile of the velocity would look like this. Okay. Now, turns out that there's a way of, of uh, deriving this, uh, deriving the exact shape of the flow without too much trouble. And uh, in particular, this problem is called that of uh, Poiseuille flow. Let me see if I can get the spelling correctly. Yeah. Okay. So the equation here to consider is, is the Navier-Stokes equation. Since it's a horizontal pipe, we don't have to worry about gravity, as in you know they're both at the same level. And so the only terms left are. plus gradient of pressure. So flow is, so the fluid is flowing only under, under the influence of pressure. And uh, um, yeah, so, okay. So this is the Navier-Stokes equation. Steady state, which is why you guessed it, which means the partial time derivative goes to zero. Yeah. The other thing is no, yeah, yeah, let's just say no body forces. In other words, the gravity terms are not important. So uh, that's what uh, this equation describes. Let us say that the velocity here is uh, described by, um, you know, uh, draw this again. Okay, this would be the x axis and this would be the y axis. So uh, the u, and there's a gradient of vx, there's a gradient of ux along y, which means that the u is very simple, it becomes u as a function of y, yeah, 0, 0. So there's only a ux, yeah, and this is the ux, and that's a function of y, which means that obviously, right, which is why viscosity is important, there's a shear here, right, but this is all there is, which means that in this equation, only this term and that term are important. The rest of the terms, they all fall away, okay? So the way to write it is it splits up into, the Navier-Stokes equation basically splits up into dp dx is equal to, right? And, right? This is how it splits it, it this equation just splits up, okay? Now you see how remarkably simple this already is beginning to look. In particular, we focus only on this, nothing else, just on this. Now as far as finding out, you know, the y variation of u is concerned, this is as good as a constant, right? Think about this. This is, and, and, oh yeah, so the other thing to uh, keep in mind is that this, this, uh, th these plates are infinite in, in, uh, in the direction perpendicular to the screen and also infinite in the x direction, okay? So that's another thing to keep in mind. So as far as this equation is concerned, the d square u d, dy squared, this is a constant. This is a dp dx. As far as the y variation is concerned, this one is a constant, right? So really what you're saying is that mu equals some constant k, okay? This can Im immediately be integrated. You take, uh, you know, uh, du dy is k times y, 
and u would be something like k y squared. In particular, the solution would be, the, and so, so this is a very simple equation to integrate and uh, in particular the solution would be something like m equal to a y plus b plus y squared over 2 this k or where this k is really, this is really a, okay. It's a pressure gradient in the x direction. So this is a plus here. I beg your pardon for my handwriting. So really, if you look at this, this is the equation of a parabola. And you apply the correct boundary conditions and it looks like a parabola. The boundary conditions would be that the velocity um, goes to zero here and here. And so, depending upon where you take the origin, if you take the origin here or if you take the origin at the center of the pipe, you can even get rid of this Ay term. And it looks just like, you know, a y squared over 2, okay? And that's exactly the equation for parabola. So this confirms our intuition, you know, that, that we started out with. And on this slide, we said, you know, uh, a viscous fluid would be something, it, it, it sticks to the boundaries and, and you would expect the velocity to be the maximum at the, uh, towards the middle and that's exactly what this looks like. So this is the solution to what's called a Poisson flow. This would be in uh, cylindrical, I mean in, in, in rectangular coordinates if you uh, specialize to a cylindrical pipe. Right, a cylindrical pipe also infinite in the x direction and uh, so, so it would be something like this. So this would be the R coordinate, in which case, and this would be the Z coordinate. It's just making small changes in, 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 in notation. The Navier-Stokes equation now, this equation, this equation, if you write this down in, in, in cylindrical coordinates, it simply turns out to be mu over R. I'm doing nothing but writing down the relevant terms of the Navier-Stokes equation in cylindrical coordinates, okay? And again, this is a constant. As far as the R variations is concerned, uh, this term is a constant. So you can see that you expand this out and you'll have a first derivative in U and a second derivative in U and uh, the, the, you apply the uh, appropriate boundary conditions and uh, turns out a radial. So again, it's a parabola. In, you will have um, real, the full solution actually will be something like, uh, so this would be a parabolic kind of thing in R as such you would have a logarithmic term, but if you apply the boundary conditions correctly, you'll find that A has to become zero and the particular solution becomes uh, this. The radius of the pipe is A, okay? So it turns out that uh, the particular solution is squared over four mu, uh, dp. This is the solution we are after, mind the two here. So this is a solution for again and, and this also the profile of this also looks like this, okay, with a maximum the center and zero at the ends. So this is a solution for flow of a viscous fluid inside a cylindrical pipe. So this is, I, I figured out, introduce these things uh, by way of simple examples of solutions to the Navier-Stokes equation, okay? And um, I have not sketched out every single step. I urge you, especially for instance, you know, applying the boundary conditions correctly so that you figure that A and B are both equal to zero and those, well, B is not equal to zero. That's how you get the A squared, right? So um, I, I urge you to, uh, you know, do those steps 
So it's useful to uh, demonstrate how uh, simple solutions to the Navier-Stokes equation, not merely talk about the equation, right? So it's in that spirit that I, I said this. Now, I figured I would say something a little off the mainstream of uh, what we've been talking about. But you see, we've been talking about viscosity a lot. And so mu, which is the viscosity coefficient, which has units of, right, is an example of what's called a transport coefficient. What does it describe? It describes the transport of momentum. And this is simply taken to be a property of the fluid. This, this, this is a particular number for a particular fluid, just like thermal conductivity or something else, right? Now, we, we talked about how transport coefficients, well, how bulk properties like density or, or velocity or some things like this are, are derived from microscopics towards the very beginning of, of the course. Let us, um, I, I figured we would revisit this thing about a viscosity coefficient and uh, in particular show how this, uh, you know, the, this corresponds to transport of momentum. Uh, in particular momentum flux between layers uh, and how, how a viscosity coefficient is derived using the concept of a mean free path using microscopics a little bit, right? Uh, it's quite simple. So let us consider a situation where you have a two-dimensional flow and uh, same thing as before. You have z like this and y like this. So you have a situation where u is equal to u as a function of y in the z direction. Okay, so the shear stress from which viscosity is derived, remember, is nothing but the net flux of z directed momentum in the y direction. In other words, if you have a layer here and here, remember our, our analogy of, uh, you know, suppose this was a viscous fluid and, and, and uh, you know, you had a larger velocity here and a smaller velocity here. Viscosity, remember, was all about little rubber bands joining these two layers, refuse that, they, and what do these little rubber bands do? They refuse to let, you know, smooth sliding happen. Let me draw these rubber bands a little bit, a little better. And so, what do the rubber bands really do? It, they carry the fact that, so th th there are particles and, and, and these would be separated by approximately one mean free path, okay, in a microscopic sense. And what they would do? So molecules or atoms as the case might be from this layer would go from here to there and carry the fact, carry the information that right here there is this amount of flux of z momentum and they would and, and, and when they hit this layer which is spaced one mean free path apart, they carry that information that there is this flux of z momentum and they, and they tell this layer about that information and when the collision happens, this layer, as a, as, a, as a result of the collision, it slows down. And so that is sort of where the rubber band analogy comes in. Okay. In particular, you can write down something like uh, a unidirectional particle, say, say, the expression for a unidirectional, sorry, crossing the y equals 0 plane. This is something like rho this is the unidirectional particle flux, well mass flux particle or I should say mass flux 
If I was strictly talking about particle flux, this would be N VRMS. If I'm talking about mass flux, it's really rho VRMS, right? And the other thing to remember here is that the magnitude of the, the average Z momentum carried by particles within a mean free path lambda, right? And so this is the other important thing. So the average Z momentum carried by particles within one mean free path now is something like du dy times lambda, okay? So you multiply that with this, right? So you have this times the rho times VRMS, okay? And uh, because of the fact that you have, you have particles going on both sides of the plane, you have a factor two, okay? Now, remember, I said the shear stress is essentially the net flux of Z momentum in the Y direction. So that is this. That completes this, the net flux of Z momentum this is the, this entire thing is a net flux of Z momentum in the Y direction. And we arrived at this from a particle kind of picture, yeah? Uh, the average Z momentum carried by particles within one mean free path is this, and this is the net particle flux. And the shear stress by definition is equal to, this is how the mu is derived from the, from the microscopics, and this is equal to du dy. So this is how you derive mu from the microscopics, from things like the RMS velocity of the particles that constitute the fluid, okay? Now remember, in order to have a meaningful definition of a fluid, you should have many, many mean free paths in any representative macroscopic length scale. So all that is very much there, but I figured this is how I would give you an illustration of how a transport coefficient such as a viscosity coefficient is derived from the microscopics, right? So in some sense, yeah, okay, so this is a macroscopic quantity, the du dy, but the rest of it are all sort of microscopics and everything really depends upon this mean free path, okay? If the mean free path is large, the viscosity would be large and vice versa. However, the mean free path, there, there are funny situations such as collisionless fluids or collisionless plasmas where the mean free path is actually the regular collisional mean free path, mean free path for regular collisions between particles is actually much larger than, than, than any uh, meaningful macroscopic length scale. And um, in such situations, you cannot apply this simple-minded uh, uh, expression and you would have to find an effective mean free path that is not simply the collisional mean free path. Let me write this down since I'm saying this uh, word over and over again, I should write this mean free and you would have to find a, a more meaningful mean free path that is not simply the collisional mean free path. Uh, but that, that's for collisionless fluids and that's a bit of a special situation. Uh, I just thought I would show how a macroscopic transport coefficient, which is regarded as a property of the fluid, is derived from the microscopics before going on to talk about the other aspects of the course and, and transitioning again to uh, fluids, uh, and not from a microscopic point of view, but the, ju just the macroscopic fluids where we simply talk in terms of transport coefficients. So that's it for now. Thank you. <laughs>